Hi everybody, I'm Dan Collison. I work for Save the Children. And I should declare a small interest, which is that I've, <laughs> I've managed to save uh, Christian Aid's programs in Kenya and Save the Children's programs in Myanmar. <laughs> in the past, so um, not, I wouldn't claim any sort of legacy impact on our, the quality of the accountability work. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm interested in this issue of formal and non-formal ways of, of, of a, approaching this. Um, Within Save the Children, we've tried, we've sort of focused a lot recently on, on identifying formal ways of doing this. We, we like it because it's sort of tangible and we can write it into proposals and we can talk about it with our teams and partners and there's something to see, a hotline, a notice board, a focus group. And they can have good results. I mean, the, the hotline in, in Pakistan that was set up for receiving complaints and feedback on the emergency response was, was buzzing. They were receiving hundreds of complaints, <laughs> <laughs> mostly around targeting. Um, but Andy dropped in at the end of the presentation there the fact that in the two case studies that he looked at, it was the informal um, accountability mechanisms that the communities preferred. And that suggests that the real skill to this isn't necessarily the hotlines and the notice boards. It's the old-fashioned community development and, and relief skills that our staff and partners have. Mm -hmm. And because they're talking and listening, or they should be talking and listening all the time to the communities they work with. And also that informal approach probably has a better chance of reaching the, most, the more marginalized or marginal members of the community, <coughs> which are probably less likely to engage on the, in, in, in the formal the formal setup. So I think what it what it suggests to say the children is we should it's some it, it comes back to sort of culture, a culture of listening, a culture of quality, which and there's a there's a management opportunity to make that work. Rather than just saying, Oh, that's interesting. We've heard from the community such and such, but actually do something about it. And to in, and to inculcate into our teams and to discuss with the partners that we work with the, the advantages of, of listening get and, and, and acting on what we're hearing. Um, so I think I, that, that, that comment at the end there provides us with some, uh, some direction to follow up and, and save the children. Hi, I'm Adelaine Williams from De Montfort University. Um, a lot of the findings, it seemed that the benefit of the accountability mechanism was linked to increased participation. Now, there's many NGOs around the world who don't implement or even know of accountability mechanisms. Um, they do good work and participatory work in evaluation, design, implementation, monitoring, etc. So my question is really, what evidence was there to show that the positive impacts were due to the account presence of the accountability mechanism and not just through good participation? Was there did the accountability mechanism act as a trigger for more participation? Did it increase participation, increase the quality of participation? So how do we de separate participation from the actual impact of the accountability mechanism? Hi, Rachel Hatton with the CDAT Network. Um, following on, I think, related to what my two colleagues have just said, um, we talk about accountability to whom, but I actually wonder if we need to rephrase it a little bit, and I just want to explore that with everyone, really. Is it about, should we be thinking more power to whom? Um, because it seems to me that in talking about accountability mechanisms, we're still one step away from communities. So in talking about information provision to, participation with, complaints mechanisms, we're very much focusing on the mechanisms um, it feels very mechanistic, in fact, the conversation, um, in many ways. And I'm wondering what the overarching goal is. You know, what is the overarching goal that, that we have at the heart of, of our work? Um, because in emphasising accountability, and you, a colleague from Demont University just said that many organisations do this sort of work, but they don't, not, don't necessarily talk about language of accountability. Surely the focus should be more around um, Simply listening, being in dialogue, communicating effectively with. And doesn't that need to be actually integrated? That sort of culture that, that, that my colleague from Say the Children mentioned is actually the, the cultural aspects are more important. And if we get away from this mechanistic view of what accountability is, and actually if we integrate good listening skills, um, 
competences around just being able to treat people with dignity and be in communication with people, um, which in a recent CBHA and ELRA competency survey across the humanitarian system, the uh, competences around simply working in equal partnership with affected people um, and being in dialogue and being in communication were severely <laughs> lacking in humanitarian organizations across the world. Um, so really, I think it's about integrating decent behavioral practices, really, around listening, being in communication throughout programming, and perhaps focusing less on accountability mechanisms at particular points in the project cycle. Um, yeah, that's my point. And uh, one of the other things, sorry, <laughs> is actually, I think that this, is this issue around communication as well um, and the advancing um, practices around communication in the sector, which imply that this work can only really be done effectively in partnership with different types of stakeholders as well, um, actually will help us to address the thorny issue of coordination uh, in, the, in the sector, which is obviously a critical issue, um, particularly with all the sort of new and, and non-traditional humanitarian actors that are in the, in the current space. Thank you very much. I'd like to give the panel a chance to respond. So, Paul, could I ask you to maybe comment on Dan's point about the informal and formal mechanisms and what it means for us? Andy, maybe you could answer Adelaide's question, um, which um, around participation and accountability. And if I could ask Nick to res um, comment on Adelaide's point about, is it about accountability or power or listening, um, the combination? I mean, it's a very good point and one, one that I would fully agree with, Dan. I, I think um, there, is a, there is a tendency, <coughs> that relates to what Rachel was saying as well, um, there is a tendency in the humanitarian sector and probably w fairly beyond the humanitarian sector to, when one's thinking about change, transformation or improvement, to focus on things rather than behaviours because things are much easier to do than behaviours. So... Um, one can fairly quickly create a mechanism and put it in place and have the, you know, the, put the box in the corner or the, uh, slightly, it takes slightly longer, but one can still do the online thing. Um, which doesn't, which in some cases might be a necessary condition, but it's never going to be a sufficient condition because those tools are only as, 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 good as the use to which they're put and the desire that people have to, to put them to use. Um, and I just add to what you're saying that in some cases actually it, rather than being a necessary condition, having the tool can be a way of resisting change. You know, because that box has now been ticked, we've done that job, so we don't need to, we don't need to actually do the hard graft, you know, the heavy lifting of, of changing, changing our behavioural practices. Um, so yes, the, the element of behavior, of relationship, of what we think we're doing here in the first place, why do we think we are in, you know, what, what, how, how is it that it's Tuesday and I'm in Wallow, kind of, you know, all of those questions um, are every bit as important, I would agree. Um, whether, whether, as Rachel was suggesting, that's all that's required, probably in, in terms of the nature of the establishing the relationship and the communication, it is. But one of the problems is, are, do our structures say we heard stuff that suggested things were wrong, and that happens quite a lot, um, do our funding structures, our organisational structures, the incentives of the way that the system is structured, allow that information to be used? So there is probably something, the, re the relational behavioural part is right at the centre there, but I'm not sure it's the whole thing. I don't know if that answered the question. I hope so, to agree. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned participation. I can remember a discussion that uh, we had, I think, in the first meeting uh, around trying to sort of think through, well, what is accountability and what's an accountability mechanism? We talked about participation, and I think someone said, oh, participation has been done to death, though. We all know it's a good thing. So, you know, why, why are we looking at it again? Um, <clears throat> and I think why we did end up including it um, is partly because participation is an important aspect of passing power um, from those delivering aid to, to those receiving it. And we didn't make a distinction between participation for accountability's sake and participation in projects. We looked at 
participation as being a key and fundamental part of uh, an accountability mechanism. So, so there was no distinction, and we looked at it on the basis that participation um, makes uh, an important is an Im an extremely important part of uh, of, of, of an accountabil of, of accountability. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily asks your question because I, I, I'm not sort of speaking to, to a distinction between different participations. I'm more saying participation is fundamental um, to accountability and that's why we sought to try and understand how it contributed um, to quality, but, but we didn't separate it out as it were, no. Nick. Uh, thanks, I think, I mean I agree with you in many, many ways, but I think in a way, probably people in this room are actually committed to this. I think it's not the case everywhere. You know, we, you know, we, I mean, I know even in Krishnaid, we're still having to argue the point in, in some places. Certainly outside, we need to be doing that. So you need to have some mechanism, some tools to prove what we are doing in order to get the sceptics on side and understanding it. And it's, yeah, then you can, and in doing that, you're looking at the way in which you behave, how you're involved, how you're communicating and doing all that. But you need to have a little bit of a, a, a push as well to, to, to get that going. And I think that's, what some, you know, that's in a way missing. And I think you know, having a tool to prove that this does work will help that. Uh, I mean, I wish it was that. I mean, I do feel it's. You know, there have been a, a, a few reports that we're that Krishna has been involved in over the last few days um, around the effect on you know, this one, another one around effectiveness of, of partners uh, and the partnership approach with uh, some other uh, uh, sort of UK agencies. To me, it's it's patently obvious. It's a good way of working. It's not the best. They all, I mean, it's the, well, it is the best, but it's the it's the <laughs> it's uh, it, there, there are challenges to it, uh, but, uh, and we need to learn from those challenges and improve the way in which we do things. Uh, but it's obvious, but we need to have that evidence, and we need to, and we also, as, as Paul said, we need to actually challenge ourselves to make sure that what we're saying, you know, that it does have uh, a basis, it's not just a, a, ni a nice belief. Uh, so I think, yes, we have to be looking at uh, the behaviours and how we communicate, but we need to have mechanisms in place to make sure that uh, you know, it, it, it pushes the behavioural change as well. Thank you. Can I take another round of questions? So I'll have the gentleman at the back, <coughs> and I'll have the lady in the middle. Hi there. Um, my name is Matthew Hill. I'm from the Institute for the Study of the Americas. Um, first of all, let me thank you for a stimulating conversation and it's certainly firing my synapses on a Friday afternoon, so I thank you for that. Um, but it's, it's, it's really talking about where the space is that where, where, where this relationship between uh, you as an international actor and the, uh, the participants that you're engaging in and where accountability operates. And it seems to me is from the discussion, and I look forward to reading it in more detail, but the discussion, the interaction of accountability is between you uh, as the international and the local community. Now, um, m so my question is about how can we go beyond that relationship? Because you know you are willing um, uh, recipients of change and engagement and interaction, and this happens within the civic space, but in the political space, where there's an engagement with the community actors and the local government or the national government, they're not going to be quite so willing necessarily to engage in that democratic process. So the question is, is how applicable is this methodology outside that interaction between a willing international actor and a local community? Uh, Elizabeth Blunt, Erin News. Um, Paul talked about occasions when the accountability mechanism throws up the fact that what people want is not necessarily what you or your donors would agree with. I wondered if any of you who've worked in the field had had examples of that and how you handle it. 
Thank you. Can I take these two and one question online, um, just so that we can get some stuff from colleagues online? So there's a question for you, Andy. Did your research consider the financial costs of applying f accountability systems? And do you think it is important to do a cost-benefit analysis? And would this be easy to measure? Um, and then maybe if I could ask Nick to answer Matthew's question mm -hmm. um, and Paul to take Elizabeth's question. Am I sourcing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think my way around that. <laughs> well, where do, should I ask somebody else to start? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Paul, would you like to start? <laughs> yes, I mean, I think the examples are legion. Um, <clears throat> I can think of two off the bat, uh, and I won't name the countries or the agencies involved, but just, just examples. One, an example of uh, food distri distribution where um, the, the ration is based on a household ration, and it, it's, uh, the idea is that that ration will be shared equally on the basis of need, um, based around certain cultural constructions of what a household and a family is, and the role of different members of the household, and the, the expectation that there will be equal, thank you, Nick. Uh, equal sharing, um, and the discovery that, of course, the the girls in the household are not receiving food because uh, within that that environment, it makes a lot more sense. Um, uh, it makes a lot more cultural sense um, to double the ration for the boy children uh, at the expense of the girl children. Um, now, that is a very widely held belief and common practice in that area, and it's it's a you know it's very tricky. Um, Another example is uh, doing um, food for work, cash for work programs with the community in a conflict environment where the community um, and the degree to which who was making the decisions there is never t entirely, uh, I think, open, transparent to someone, particularly someone who doesn't speak the language and outside of it doesn't speak the language. Um, but the community, which comes back to the, the idea of how communal are actually communities, um, were very, very keen to put in this con conflict of our put military defences in as the work that they did for their food for work, and that was the unanimous first choice of what they wanted to do, um, which made perfect sense because the civilian population was, was threatened by um, aggression, um, but it was also very handy for the, uh, the combatant groups in the area that that was what... So that, again, would, would play sort of merry hell with one's ideas of, of neutrality and impartiality. Um, and I think these are very, I mean, I think everyone's got their stories and, and, and these are very, these are probably more common, these examples, than the example where everything is kind of, you know, all, all the different actors are, are in agreement about what is the right thing to do, perhaps. Thanks, Paul. Nick? Uh, I think the, the uh, Matthew's questions around uh, how do we go beyond uh, just having sort of uh, our relationship with the uh, populations that we're working with and the accountability there. I think one of the things that uh, uh, some of the evidence has shown is that, and I think the example in, in, the, in the report was around Myanmar, where uh, communities have actually got greater strength to be able to, by, by developing a good relationship, <coughs> having accountability mechanisms and being able to feed back uh, views and having them acted upon with, uh, organize, with, with, uh, with, with, with Save the Children in this case, uh, they develop strength to actually challenge more broadly in public meetings, uh, challenge local authorities to actually um, to, you know, to challenge what, what, what they're doing. It, it, it developed that, that, that strength to speak out uh, for, 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 yeah, for, for things that they were, uh, are entitled to. Maybe another example uh, where, uh, from uh, some work that Christian Aid was involved with uh, in, in Ethiopia which is not the country which is easiest to, uh, for communities to engage with the local authorities. Uh, and through uh, some, some work which we had done with communities around, uh, I'm, I'm, I think it's some sort of livelihoods uh, program, uh, when engaging with the local authorities, uh, people saying, well, this is what we want, this is our program, and we want you, the local authorities, to deliver it. The, the, the way in which it was done had actually strengthen them to be able to stand up and, uh, and uh, 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 challenge uh, governments far beyond the actual very specific work that we were actually doing. So I think having these mechanisms in place, the way in which 
we work and way in which we, in, you know, uh, the, the, the dialogue is encouraged can actually cr develop the strength of individuals, of community to challenge wherever that is, not just uh, feeding back and uh, uh, reporting back to the, to the agency who they may be working with. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, cost-benefit analysis of uh, <laughs> accountability <laughs> mechanisms, <coughs> now that, that would certainly be a challenge. And I was thinking, we discussed a fair amount um, within the uh, case studies the costs of accountability, and it has a financial cost, a uh, human resource cost potentially. It's extra work to do for an agency or uh, equally for a community uh, of people. Um, and so, yes, there's a cost. Um, I guess the extent to which we managed to get to was, yes, there are efficiencies to be achieved by having accountability mechanisms, um, and there are potential um, wins around value for money as well. Did we quantify those? No. Um, and and it, it's an in interesting question as to what you would need to, to do to be able to do a cost-benefit analysis of, uh, uh, of, account of accountability mechanisms. So, so it's a fascinating question, but the short answer is our view, for, for the myriad reasons which we've discussed, is that the cost is worth it. But... <laughs> What I can't say is I can't give an answer on the cost benefit. So, um, yeah, very, very interesting question, but no, we didn't. Okay, thank you. Can I take another round? Um, I believe the gentleman there. <laughs> uh, first of all, yeah, thank you all for um, interesting contributions. Um, the last time I was here um, talking about accountability, I actually asked, um, well, where is the evidence of any impact of all these accountability mechanisms? And I'm afraid I'm now going to doubt the evidence a bit. <laughs> because um, I'm wondering, w w how did you define the impact? How did you define quality? How did you define an increase in it? A and what was the baseline? So how did you know that once we started with accountability mechanisms, the change was actually from the accountability mechanisms and not from something else? And, and all these things I missed a little bit, and I was quickly going through the methodology. Sorry, I hadn't had the time to get through the whole document yet, but I was missing that a bit. And so I wonder, that first line there, accountability mechanisms do strengthen the quality and impact of projects. I hope I can find it once I start reading it, that that is really, that we really have that evidence. Because I wonder, and so I would love to know, well, how did you define it and then how convinced are you? Hello, Annie Devonport from the DEC. Uh, interestingly, uh, I'm slightly echo uh, you. Um, I don't know your name, sorry, sorry. but uh, your concerns. Um, in, and I was a bit surprised that you couldn't find any counterfactuals. Um, I'm, I'm currently reading the, I think it's called Time to Listen, the listening project, which is just peppered with <laughs> examples of what happens when there isn't good accountability. Um, it, that's the main thesis of the, of the, of the uh, study, which was done over several years. With that book, I'm slightly concerned because a lot of the a lot of the examples go back a lot of years, and I think I think there've been huge improvements since they started their research. But it, it I mean, I'm convinced. I'm, I'm convinced because in my heart I'm convinced, and it's and I believe it's the right thing to do. So I'm, c I'm kind of convinced, but I, but I wonder whether the study has actually <coughs> proven it. I think it, it's uh, I think it's the robustness that I would would question. I'm Vivian Walden from Oxfam, and I'm sorry, Andy, I'm going to criticise as well. Um, but then, you know you know me, right? Um, two things, really. Um, you talked about your literature review, but it seems to be only the grey literature and nothing from the academic world. Um, so that concerns me a little bit as well. And then I suppose the attribution question, because it kind of goes against our policy of having the the community as an equal, if we're saying, well, we've empowered them and, and actually they were, you know, and now they're doing all these wonderful things about talking to the bank or talking to these, and that if we hadn't been there, they wouldn't have been able to do it. And, and that kind of bothers me, because first of all, how are we going to prove it? And also, it it's sort of smacks of that they were all sitting there waiting for us to come along and, and help them, and they wouldn't have been able to do it without that. And I, I don't want to go down that line. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to give it to the lady? Hi, I'm Nazma from Plan UK. Um, 
I'm trying to kind of look into the accountability and the relationship with the, you know, beyond that community. I know, you know, other relationship we kind of, you know, talked about. But for me, it's when we talk about the behavioral, the cultural thing, it's what we actually do within the organization. I mean, it should not be an extra job. It's like, you know, within the organization, within management, within our governance system, the whole, this accountability framework needs to be there. So we should not be just looking into the project side that whether we are doing the information participation and the mecha you know, complaint mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's within like our you know, working, everyday work, are we actually practicing that? You know, rather looking for whether the accountability mechanism working our relationship with the community, rather you know, my, our day-to-day -day practice, are we actually practicing or are we behaving in the you know, right way so that we can measure the same you know, impact within the organization. Okay, I'm gonna take one more on this side, then I'll come back to the panel. Oh, there's nobody. Uh, oh, sorry, you are there. Hello, uh, my name is Rabia Yazbek. I'm researcher around legitimacy and accountability and performance. My question is about uh, the negative impact that accountability can have on, on the population and the communities. And not, I'm not talking as, as a skeptical here, but something you know to learn from, as a lessons to learn from. And not in terms of limitations, but more ab about the negative impact that, can, that an accountability mechanism can impact the dynamics, uh, the institutionalization of, of, the, uh, of the system itself, of the mechanism itself, and how it can prevent these organizations from being fluid, from uh, they can impact the, the other aspects of the project itself. So, yeah, that's my question. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have enough questions here. So what I'd like to do is cluster the three methodology questions mm. that were um, raised by colleagues in the audience and ask you if you could answer that. Um, um, if possible, Nick, I'd like you to answer Asma's question on behavior and is it an additional job or is it just, just how we do business in the NGO community? And Rabbi, if you could, uh, sorry, Paul, if you could answer Rabbi's question about the negative impact of accountability on population. It's a very interesting question. On the methodology, um, I think it's absolutely correct to um, look at it, to test it, to um, see if it's fit for purpose. Um, and in approaching it, what we tried to do um, was to, I suppose, to balance the somewhat conflicting tensions of trying to do a rigorous piece of research um, against trying to offer the community something which was potentially replicable. And we knew that there was a risk there, that the risk was that the sort of scientific side of the research would be compromised by um, the motivation to try and um, get something that's sufficiently practical to allow uh, agencies to implement in the field. Um, and I mean, in terms of critiquing the methodology, what, what I've what we've done is to publish the methodology paper which you have. And so would certainly, I think part of, part of this, this um, part of the process is around trying to understand the extent to which it has sufficient rigor and the, to the, the extent to which we can, um, we can stand by the findings that, that it provides and how we can strengthen it and how as a, as a sector we can sort of build the quality of the evidence. So uh, to be fair, I would say that I'm sure there are deficiencies in terms of the, um, in terms of having a scientific, a more scientific approach um, to the methodology. And we were conscious of some of the trade-offs that we made. I think what we'd be interested in is actually seeing how we can minimize the impact of those trade-offs and actually make it more rigorous and, and more robust. So rather than sort of hiding from criticism, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to embrace it and to see where that takes us in terms of saying, well, well, where next? And I know that HAP potentially has other organizations who are interested in trialing the methodology. And I think there's a fantastic opportunity having offered up something for scrutiny and for, for comment to, to then say, right, here we, we've got something which begins to answer some of the questions. It's imperfect, um, 
what are the concerns about? What are the key concerns and how can we strengthen those? And um, yeah, I think um, Vivian on the literature review, no, fair comment. We, we put out um, a request to agencies around provide, of the peer learning group to provide input. Um, and we got, um, it was around 80 documents or so, and that was supplemented by about another 30 or 40 documents um, from uh, a, a literature search which included some academic, docu some academic journals and documents, but, but relatively few. Yes, so the literature re review was limited in its scope, yeah. Um, and counterfactuals, I would agree with you, there are numerous <laughs> counterfactuals. There's, I'm sure there's no end of counterfactuals and we can all, we can all um, uh, speak to those. I, I think what we were particularly <coughs> interested in um, was, was in getting counterfactuals that were linked to the factual, to the, to the studies themselves, so we could actually go a greater extent to isolating the contribution <coughs> uh, of, a, of the accountability mechanism. So, so what in a perfect world, two projects, one that has had no, um, has not benefited from any uh, of the accountability mechanisms and another that has what's considered to be an effective and fully functioning accountability mechanism would have allowed us to go a little bit further uh, uh, in terms of our convictions around the contribution um, made to, to, to project quality um, rather than trying to compare apples and pears which we did think about but, but backed off just because of the complexities of actually trying to uh, the complexities around trying to make that comparison with any degree of, 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 of rigor and, and, and understanding. Thank you. Nick? Maybe just uh, following up on that uh, last point, uh, one of the recommendations was for uh, the uh, humanitarian country uh, uh, teams actually to try and take that forward. And I think if, we, if that was to happen, if things were to go to scale, then actually you would be able to make a much stronger uh, comparison uh, and uh, get uh, uh, more evidence. So maybe that would be a way of actually trying to do that because I think that it's it's right, we, it, there's more, we need to be able to get the evidence of we are where things are not in place compared to where things have been put in place and that may be a way of actually uh, trying to do that. On uh, Nasma's point, I mean I completely agree, I think it very much is the way in which, it's, it shouldn't be something that's an extra added on thing, it should be the way in which uh, uh, we work and I think uh, as Rachel mentioned uh, earlier, yeah, there was uh, uh, the work that's been done with CBHA and people in aid about looking at the competences and the way in which people uh, worked and uh, uh, it, there's very little actually happening on the how people are doing the work or there's not, no that's not quite right, there's, there's, there, there's not enough in place, formally in place about the importance of how people work and the way in which they relate to, to others, the way in which they communicate and listen. Uh, and there's more that could be uh, done with that. And I think you know, that's an, an, an organisational thing which we should be looking at and, and, and putting into place. And certainly uh, taking forward the, the work that was done uh, with CPH and, and people in aid uh, to develop the, those core uh, humanitarian competencies. So yes, I think it should be uh, organisational. Thanks. Could I speak just to the evidence piece as well, sure. just for a second, because I, I think it's really interesting. Um, I d and and because, uh, but just just a few thoughts on that, on the on the sort of evidential um, value of what's here. I, I think looking across, as 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 many of you'll know, evidence in humanitarian action was uh, the topic of the last down lap annual meeting, and so it's it's something that we were able to take quite a a wide view across the sector of and. Um, I think one of the problems about uh, the robustness of causality and attribution is a very real problem for humanitarians because uh, the experimental approaches which traditionally have been used in social policy to establish, you know, you, 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 ha you, do, you run an experiment where you basically say, um, we have the group that we're looking at and we have another group which are identical in every <coughs> way apart from the fact that they have not received this benefit. And if the group that we're looking at end up doing one thing and the other group end up doing another thing, then we can show that it was, it was the benefit, the, the input that made the difference, if that makes sense. 
Um, it's extremely difficult to do, one, because of ethics, obviously. It means, in, in many cases, you would have to deny, actively deny people something uh, to establish a counterfactual group. And so what you would attempt to do would be a natural experiment, which is what I understand w was attempted here, which is you attempt to find, rather than actually creating a control, you attempt to find a natural control, another group which are identical in every way, but just you haven't happened to reach that group. Uh, or provide the benefit to that group. The problem with that is where natural experiments have been used, in several examples in, in humanitarian practice, because the populations tend to be fairly mobile and in contact with one another, your control group is generally contaminated, to use the terminology, because they have also received some of the benefit of the input. Is this making sense so far? Yeah. And so the, the, there is a real problem with using experimental approaches, and it's doubly true where you're attempting to use experimental approaches uh, around um, issues which are not amenable to objective verification. So that's things which are perceptional or attitudinal. And this is a big issue, for example, if we were to try and look at the, the impact, you know, to attribute the impact of... Um, uh, certain kinds of protection, you know, certain certain sort of interventions in the field of prote protection, because many of the benefits of protection are also uh, perceived and sensed rather than being things which can be objectively measured. So, um, I think you raised, Jerome, there a very interesting question. We have to do better, I would suggest, to my understanding, than hoping that experiments will work for us. And therefore, we need to find other mechanisms which can establish some level of contribution, if not attribution, um, which rely on non-statistically <coughs> valid methodologies. And what I think is very interesting about this piece of work is the amount of thinking that went into, on the part of the team and the community more generally, how that might be done. And two, two in a, not innovations, but two areas that, that, that as, as Andy says, you know, this whole thing is to be thrown open and to be challenged and to be improved. Um, two areas which I think it would be very interesting to address in terms of the challenge and the improvement is to what degree uh, <laughs> is the mechanism that was used narrative? You know, if people, and you have to obviously be very careful not to ask leading questions which imply that there is a connection, but to what degree does, do, it does establishing questions whereby people talk about a connection and bring up the connection, what is the robustness of that in terms of attribution? Because sometimes that's going to be all you've got. Um, and also, uh, what are the other mechanism that was used here was pattern matching, where if everybody is saying the same thing and nobody is saying a different thing, and the thing that they're saying would tend to prove or advance the hypothesis, is that a robust enough approach to say that, therefore, we're not saying the hypothesis has been proved, because in social science you never prove hypotheses, of course, but we're saying that the hypothesis has been advanced. Um, and uh, to my understanding, the actually the methodology uses those two approaches, and it does it fairly effectively, and it's actually, and it would be very interesting to see other people using those methodologies uh, and seeing the degree to which they stack up in other contexts. Um, so sorry, that was a rather long answer, but uh, about about something that that, that Alnap we're very very passionate about. Um, and maybe that came through. Um, <laughs> on 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 the issue of negative impacts, um, I th I think that's absolutely fascinating. But if you don't mind, I just uh, and if we have a minute, I'd like to ask you what you think the negative impact might be, because I don't think I've got a good answer. But I think it's a really interesting question. <coughs> I don't know, but I, my assumption is that there is a big influence on the dynamics of the re relationships between the uh, agency and the population. And accountability can lead to uh, a skeptical kind of uh, population mm -hmm. when you are going and ask them all the time about uh, complaints, about can, can raise the question why you're asking this. So it, it, it's, it can uh, change the dynamics of these relationships mm -hmm. between the two parties. And second, uh, uh, again, uh, like it can restrict uh, the uh, 
these concepts are, are, are it sh they should be cons co uh, cons contextualized uh, because they are all social socially constructed subjects. So <coughs> and it depends on uh, on where it's implemented. So if it's these mechanisms are not r uh, robust enough, they may create kind of uh, 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 can. Uh, um stop the organization or create, uh, uh, limit the organization from uh, uh, implementing uh, a uh, 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 dynamic kind of approach and uh, because the, the institutionalization of such a mechanism can uh, become rigid and create problems in the implementation itself. So, I don't know. Uh, these are some assumptions, I guess. Uh, if, if I may, the piece that I'd take out of that, which I think is fascinating, is, is the piece about dynamic, the fluidity and dynamism of human societies, and that and uh, within the societies that we're working, and between the societies of our organizations and the societies with whom we're working. Um, and, and, and I think that's very interesting, because, of course, anything that is dynamic and in flux, any intervention could have multiple uh, consequences, not all of which, very few of which perhaps, are the ones that we planned that it would have. Mm. So I think it's a fascinating idea. Thanks, Paul. I, we only have time for one more round. So I'm going to start with um, a question online from Frederica Sawyer, who is an independent consultant from the United States. Um, Andy, um, Frederica would like to know if you found any evidence or indicators that feedback accountability mechanisms um, led to informing agencies beyond the project level to informing their own or their donors' policy. And then I'll take two more questions, one from this side and one from this side. I'll start with the lady back there, yeah. Thank you very much, Sophia Dawkins from Conflict Dynamics International. I actually wanted to ask a question associated with rabies, which is particularly associated about conflict sensitivity and the extremely powerful finding that you found from the research that actually these accountability mechanisms actually um, encouraged and empowered people to make demands from duty bearers. Um, and I wanted to ask this because Nick Gutman highlighted something that I think a lot of us agree, that a lot of these projects and the accountability mechanisms themselves have this objective of helping people challenge power and stand up for themselves. Yet, um, in fragile contexts, um, this can have extremely dangerous effects. And, I mean, to give an example, um, I've worked most of the time in South Sudan, and I've sadly been in situations where such accountability mechanisms, when used with women, have actually um, increased their vulnerability to domestic violence. But there are other sort of negative consequences in fragile scenarios that that can happen. Um, so I wanted to ask whether in that research, whether you saw this empowerment effect be unambiguously positive, and if so, what lessons you could draw from doing accountability in a conflict-sensitive fashion. And I believe we had a lady back there. Oh. Um, Andy, just a quick question about, c you mentioned a um, number of times about community ownership being strengthened. Can you speak a bit more about that? Obviously that kind of um, informs the power dynamics between aid agencies or communities in, in particular situations and it would be great to find out what that looks like in, in the two contexts. Thank you. So Andy, three questions directed at you and then maybe I'd ask Paul and Nick if they had anything to add to it. Um, Maybe I'll start with the, I, I, I agree with what you're saying about the potential for changes in power, for um, accountability mechanisms um, to influence um, conflict dynamics. Interestingly, at the time uh, I did the study, and in both study areas, um, there was, the community was fairly homogenous. Um, and there was a general absence of conflict. And I say that at the time because it was only several days afterwards that particularly in Mactilla in Myanmar then there was um, conflict which broke out, which um, uh, uh, ironically at the time that, that there wasn't any evidence of that. Um, but so, so the research itself 
in the two countries didn't have doesn't have much to say in terms of a way that um, mechanisms can um, um, can impact on on conflict. No, I don't know if any of the panel want to add to that. I mean, I, I, th I think it's probably more, uh, you know, not from the research, uh, but in, in, in general terms, I think you need to be, it's to do with being very context specific and doing what you can in the different environments where, where you're working. In some places you can uh, have the mechanisms which are very open, transparent, and you can really encourage lots of discussion and debate and uh, uh, and and you know, creating change that way in other environments you have to be much more cautious uh, and uh, you're know, recognizing that what you may do it may be what you think is right but actually could have uh, sort of un unexpected consequences like the example uh, that that you were, you were giving but I think it's the you know, it goes back to what Nasma was saying earlier about the way in which people are working in those environments if you're creating if as the you know in uh, very sensitive environments if you're working in a way which just separates yourself out saying I know what's best I will do X Y and Z full stop without really giving opportunities for challenge or engagement or saying we will do X Y and Z and you will do it you'll you'll create the environment where the problems that you you express are more likely to happen if you implement those programs in a way which is much more sensitive, which is much more uh, understanding of the context, it's maybe less likely that you, that those direct consequences will happen. But you will still uh, strengthen uh, individuals' ability to challenge in whatever way they can. I mean, I'm not sure that really answered it, but I think it's, it is the way in which it's working. I mean, I've also uh, worked in, in South Sudan, and uh, uh, just, you know, at the very least, uh, talking about what people are entitled to and making sure people are aware of it it's uh, uh, and that there are ways of feeding back it's very very small but it actually just slightly pushes the uh, increases the empowerment of the the, the, the the people that we're working with on the issue of community ownership um, it was interesting because what did come up um, <coughs> from the different case studies so um, the villages where there were stronger accountability mechanisms um, versus the villages where the mechanisms were either younger or, or incomplete or, or, or weaker. Um, this issue of community ownership um, th was, um, was, was different from village to village. And so there was a sense that where communities had um, played a role in determining the, the nature of um, interventions, um, where they felt like they were equal partners with the organisation, um, with the implementing agency, then, then what came up more frequently and very powerfully was, around, was, was a, this uh, is, issue around ownership and engagement and, and looking at it from the, from the other, other angle is, again, when discussions were around, well, if you weren't involved in that way, um, what would be the difference? Then there was a very strong sort of kickback, saying, "Well, you know, we wouldn't value it in the same way. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be part of us. It wouldn't be part of a community." And again, it's interesting. There are a number of examples which were given around other projects which had gone on in the area um, that didn't either didn't elicit the same level of participation or didn't uh, have a complaints mechanism, and people were able to identify reasons why um, the projects either, as far as they were concerned, weren't, didn't have the same, um, weren't of the same quality or didn't, didn't, didn't offer the same benefits to them. Um, so I don't know if that sort of answers your question or if there's... Yeah. I haven't read the report yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so certainly, um, 
for both of the projects, the communities had um, a f pretty much power to, well, within defined parameters, so within a, a basket of interventions, the community had power to, de to decide what type of intervention best suited them um, and <coughs> also had a degree of power to, to ask, um, to, to determine how that was, um, how that intervention was managed, and also to look at issues around their capacity to um, to be able to successfully deliver the project and get the outputs which they wanted from it, and then to ask um, uh, or seek ways with which that capacity could be um, could be strengthened. So, so in the projects that I looked at, the, the community had a, a fair degree of latitude to select different types of interventions. Um, and were, were whole, were broadly responsible for, for, for the aspects of, around monitoring and implementation. So it, 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 there was a significant um, role the community played in both determining projects and also implementing them and, and monitoring them. The policy question? Yes, sorry, remind me of a policy question. Um, it was, did you find any evidence that um, the uh, feedback influenced yep. agency or donor policy? I guess m and my, the research really looked at a country level and stopped short of then going, um, looking at the broader organisation. So it might be that others in this room could provide examples of how accountability mechanisms and their use uh, and feedback from them have influenced, have had influence on broader organisational agendas. Certainly what I noted for both Myanmar um, and for Kenya was that um, both Christian Aid and Save the Children <coughs> had sought to understand um, how the accountability mechanisms worked, um, but also to, to listen to the feedback that came back and to think to, to, to think through the implications of that on how they were delivering projects and how they were structured at a national level. So what I do know is that there was a process, um, particularly for, for Christian Aid, where th they had actually scrutinised their own accountability mechanism, they had reflected on their practice, they'd actually found several deficiencies, and they had changed the way that they worked at a country level in order to, to address some of those. So, uh, and that's the sort of the limit to my participation in, in the research. So certainly at a country level, yes, feedback from communities um, through the chain that I've mentioned, the various links had actually led to organizational change at country level, yes. Thank you. I'm afraid in the interest of time, I'm not going to ask each of our panelists to give us their final thought um, on today's session. It's been a very, very rich discussion, and I'm not even going to try and summarize <laughs> such a rich discussion. But I just want to leave us with um, a few thoughts. We started the journey on accountability thinking it's a good idea or it's a moral imperative. Um, then we had the HAP guidance, which gave us a bit of structure to work around. Today, we are beginning to test and assess the impact of accountability. So evidence is beginning to emerge. There are questions about whether the methodology is robust enough or it needs to be more scientific. But I think the fact that we are starting the journey of evidence means that there is room for us to actually discuss amongst ourselves what the different methodologies might be for us to have the kind of evidence that um, we need going forward. Having said that, it has fundamental issues about not just how we do our day-to-day -day business, but our fundamental value systems and our behaviors as development practitioners. So how do we embed that beyond this room? And finally, how do we deal with what comes out of the evidence? How do we realistically embrace it and see it as a platform for continual improvement, even the challenging issues that we might not feel too comfortable hearing? Before I say my thank yous, I'd like to give David just a few minutes, um, from David from HAP, a few minutes to just give us a message. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to introduce a report that will be launched next week. Just before that, I want to give 
two additional bits of information on some questions that were raised. The first one is on the cost of accountability. It's a question that has been raised a number of times in, in the past few months. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. And there isn't really any answer or data that exists on that. So as HAP, we've decided to try to tackle this issue. We have two small research projects that we do, we're going to do over the next few months in partnership with uh, a couple of universities. Um, and if, as an accountable organization, you have uh, the willingness to help provide some data on that, uh, please uh, come and talk to me. We'll be happy to have your input into that. Uh, the second thing is, is on the robustness of the methodology. I remember when we started discussing about this project and, and the initial discussion with ALNAP, I remember that you know, so many issues were raised on how, what we should be doing to ensure that it was robust enough. I think at some point I thought, yeah, should, should we really get started on this? Or, you know, because if we want to be as scientific as we would like to be, then we'll probably need $200,000 to do a really good study and, and wait a long time before we get there. So, well, instead we decided, let's try to jump into this, try to do research that is as cost effective as possible and robust as possible. And the result is what you have heard. And we're very much aware of the limitations of the study. And we very much welcome your feedback on how the methodology could be improved. And we're also looking forward to, to having uh, additional organizations taking uh, uh, the study forward and piloting it as well to try to provide counterfactual. Uh, in Geneva, when we launch on Monday, we'll have on the panel uh, two representatives of the UN uh, from the UNDP-led early recovery cluster and the co-chair of the ISC Accountability to Affected Populations Task Force. So it will be a good opportunity to ask this last question about, about the transformative agenda. Uh, and so finally, what I wanted to, to let you know is that uh, next week we're going to launch the Humanitarian Accountability Report for those who us, of, of you who are like me and never find time to read all the interesting reports that come out, uh, it's a report that is looking back at what has happened in terms of quality and accountability in the past 10 to 15 years and tries to summarize and critically uh, analyze the developments, the obstacles in the sector. So I think it could save you a bit of time in reading a bunch of other reports and <laughs> bring you up to date on what has happened on policy uh, level and on, on practical level. So it will be available on the HAP website as of 27 of June. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'd like to begin by saying a very big thank you to ODI and HAP for hosting us today. Um, the next um, ALNAP annual meeting is on the theme of engagement of affected populations in humanitarian assistance. And when is that? That's in February. So in you need to be starting to think about the uh, various presentations and uh, inputs from the ALNAP membership, um, particularly because we're extremely keen that the ALNAP meeting, which will be held in Addis, um, as it's about the engagement of affected populations, engages some legitimate representatives of affected populations in the meeting. In the, in the meeting. So uh, we need to be thinking about how we can do that. Thank you. So um, if I can um, take the liberty of saying on behalf of Save the Children, Christian Aid and ALNAP, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon, for your active participation. And I apologize profusely for being a terrible chair and keeping you seven, mi seven minutes behind schedule. <laughs> However, there are refreshments to compensate for that. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.